So hello everyone and welcome to another conversation of the fourth cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. And today it's my great honor to introduce you to Vittorio Galese. Vittorio Galese is professor of psychobiology at the University of Parma, Italy, a joint senior researcher scholar at the Columbia University in New York in the USA and honorary fellow of the Institute of Philosophy of the School of Advanced Study of the University of London. Cognitive neuroscientist, his research focuses on the relation between the sensory motor system and social cognition by investigating the neurobiological grounding of intersubjectivity, psychopathology, language, and aesthetics. He is the author of more than 300 scientific publications and three books. Vittorio, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. I am so honored. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here with you today. And uh, I'll start by sharing uh, uh, the screen. And please let me know if um, something uh, doesn't work properly. Okay, so, so far we can see. Yeah, but, okay. Yes. I need to get rid uh, of this, okay. So um, I'm going to talk um, for a while about uh, the body space and the brain in the experience of architecture. To the left of the slide, you, you, you see a, a recent snapshot uh, on the way it now looks Columbus Circus. Um, I wasn't in New York for a few years and I could barely recognize the landscape. So I, I will try to address uh, the topic of the experience of architecture, particularly from uh, a, top, a, a bottom up and bodily perspective, emphasizing how closely related the experience of architecture and social practices are. So I, I also invite you to think about uh, what sort of social practices uh, living in buildings uh, with uh, such a shape may elicit, and alternatively, uh, had they been designed differently, what kind uh, of different quality of the social practice they might have induced. Um, I would like to deal with the experience of uh, architecture from uh, uh, a naturalizing perspective, or more precisely uh, qualifying this approach as a biocultural approach. What does it mean uh, to approach the experience of architecture from a biocultural point of view? It means that, uh, at least in my opinion, neuroscience and empirical experimental aesthetics, by studying the reception and the neurobehavioral correlates of the experience of architecture, can shed light on the way we perceive urban settings, buildings, interiors, and design objects. So far, most of our research, with notable exceptions, um, have been carried out uh, uh, in the most artificial setting one can possibly think of, namely within laboratories, for a variety of reasons, all of which uh, have uh, their justification uh, to being fully in control of uh, what's going on, uh, to time lock, uh, uh, the recording of uh, brain or physiological activity with the actual experience of the participants to the experiments, uh, uh, the possibility to uh, control exactly the quality of the image or stimuli uh, to be submitted to participants and the like. Everybody knows uh, that this is a very artificial uh, uh, take on the experience of architecture, which normally occurs uh, outside the, the walls of a lab. And um, I think that um, the more the technology will enable us uh, to take all of these measures in, in a less invasive and wireless way, the more we will be able uh, to uh, study uh, the biobehavioral uh, uh, correlates of uh, the experience of architecture uh, in real life settings. Bearing in mind that we're still running experiments and therefore this aspect, uh, the experimental quality of the experience uh, 
lived by participants uh, is something that uh, we will never be able to totally erase. But certainly, there's still a long way to go uh, uh, before we can uh, uh, approach the real experience uh, of architecture, which means uh, hanging around in the street, looking at buildings, entering those buildings, uh, living within architectural spaces um, and the like. Um, another caveat, uh, when I speak of aesthetics within this uh, specific uh, approach, I want to use it in the broadest possible term. We all know that aesthetics, uh, historically speaking, uh, uh, at a certain point started designating uh, a specific discipline uh, dealing with the experience of uh, art, what we now designate uh, uh, as art. Of course, uh, a human creativeness uh, uh, and cultural artifacts are much, much older than the historically determined uh, notion of art. So the advantage of uh, relying on this broader notion of aesthetics, which stick to its uh, etymology um, first enables to ground immediately the notion of aesthetics uh, uh, within a bodily account. Because when we speak of uh, aesthesis, uh, we refer to the sensory motor and affective feature of our experience of perceptual objects, all kinds of perceptual objects. Of course, when we refer to those particular perceptual object that uh, deal with architecture, we need to introduce a specific qualification. But I think that um, the idea to start uh, uh, with, a, with a broad notion of aesthetics uh, offer more advantages uh, than uh, uh, applying the, the notion, the term in the historically determined narrower uh, meaning it acquired. So, by using experimental aesthetics, also a very old uh, term that we can uh, date back to remain in Germany to Fechner, we can now look at the aesthetic symbolic dimension of human nature, not only from the traditional cognitive, semiotic and hermeneutic perspective, but starting exactly from the dimension of bodily presence. And the notion of bodily presence is at the center of the a very interesting book uh, written by Hans Gumbrecht uh, in 204, The Production of Presence, What Meaning Cannot Convey. Here is uh, two short quotes from the book. Uh, begin quote, every human contact with the things of the world contains both a meaning and a presence component. Let me gloss this uh, quote by adding that perhaps uh, in the last 70 years or so in the uh, particularly in the last century, uh, we focus uh, perhaps almost exclusively on the meaning component uh, uh, without paying enough attention to the presence component. And the presence component is important because uh, also uh, following Gumbrecht, what we call aesthetic experience always provides us with certain feelings of intensity we cannot find in the historically and culturally specific everyday worlds that we inhabit. So there is um, a further qualification of our experience of perceptual object, of those particular perceptual objects that are human made, like buildings, rooms, design objects, uh, which uh, calls for an intensified experience uh, of presence and as such qualify the particular aesthetic experience of those particular objects. So the biocultural level of description, which try to combine uh, topics that uh, so far have been traditionally dealt with uh, almost exclusively by disciplines within the humanities, also from a neurobiological uh, perspective, um, can enable us to analyze and perhaps revise the concepts that we normally use when referring to our social nature, therefore intersubjectivity, but also aesthetics in the traditional narrower uh, meaning of the world and architecture, as well as when referring to the experience we make of 
uh, art, cultural artifacts and architecture. So uh, my approach of experimental aesthetics is qualified by this starting assumption. Let's consider cultural artifacts at the beginning as perceptual objects and therefore use the notion, the broadest uh, notion of aesthetics as a starting point. But I also introduced the notion of intersubjectivity. Every cultural artifacts uh, is human made and therefore by definition becomes uh, the mediator between different subjectivities, the subjectivity of the creator of the cultural artifact and the subjectivity of the people making experience of the very same uh, cultural artifact. Therefore, the notion of empathy uh, is crucial. A very old notion that now, uh, particularly after our discovery of mirror neurons started being explored, uh, explored also by neuroscience. And this particular notion of empathy can reframe the problem of how architectural spaces are experienced, revitalizing, as we will see, and empirically validating many old intuitions on the relationship between body empathy space and aesthetic experience. So let me focus briefly on habits and social practices, because habits and social practices characterize our life, our human life, and uh, they characterize uh, uh, that particular expression of human life that we designate as culture. Here is a quote from Pascalian Meditation by Bourdieu, a French sociologist, uh, uh, whose notion of habit or habitus, uh, I think it's particularly handy for uh, the, the topics I want to address with you uh, today. Begin quote, social agents are endowed with habitus inscribed in their bodies from past experiences. These systems of patterns of perception appreciation and action, allow them to perform acts of practical knowledge based on the identification and recognition of conventional conditional stimuli to which they are predisposed to react. So any building, any dwelling automatically evokes social practices because it is in turn the outcome of specific social practices. So habits, in a word, consists of schemas of perception, thought, and action, producing individual and collective practices, which in turn reproduce the generative schemas. And the body is the key player here. The body determines habits and social practices, but at the same time, it is shaped by them. And it is because of the reciprocity of body and social practices, the cultural artifacts are created. So if this is true, we can no longer address architecture without starting from the point of view of social practices. The social practices that architectural uh, uh, objects determine, solicit, uh, favor, trigger. The creation of cultural artifacts and the consequent cultural practices and institution emerge from the implicit knowledge, the implicit memories, the complex set of behavioral paradigms that individuals simulate and internalize mimetically by relating to their peers, their social peers, due to the constant interpersonal relationship they have within their dense network of social exchanges. So the social, dimension, at, um, as I think uh, it should be already apparent from this part of my talk, uh, is crucial, it's central, uh, it's uh, unprecedented. So let's see now closely the relation between space body and neuroscience. Our motor potentialities shape and define the world we perceive. One is the discovery made by neuroscience in the last 40 years or so, is the following. Part of our motor system can be activated without any consequent uh, movement uh, being acted out. So in other words, 
the motor system can activate and lead to a series of excitatory output signals that finally get to the muscles, determining uh, our bodily movements. But at the same time, part of the motor system can be active without any specific message being issued to our muscles. In that particular condition, we do not move, but we simulate movement. And this motor simulation, in my opinion, is a crucial ingredient enabling us to build our perceptual world. Our brain body expresses uh, the uh, uh, range of potential relationship with the world leading to the establishment of a relational self. So our identity, our subjectivity, who we really are is in turn at the root, at its core dimension, determined by the relational potentialities expressed by our sensory motor brain, which in turn is determined by the way our body developed within uh, uh, the physical reality in which uh, biologically evolved. Modeling and delimiting the horizon of the world in which we live. So we know and understand our world, our Umwelt, by virtue of the relational potentialities instantiated by our body, which in turn shape and model the brain's sensory motor schemes. So this is uh, one of the key starting assumptions that in my opinion are required to be put on the table before addressing any topic even remotely related to architecture. We have learned through the years that frontoparietal motor areas are neurally integrated, not only, as I said, to control action, but also can be reused in this uh, simulative uh, uh, mode of uh, functioning, also to serve the function of building an integrated bodily formatted representation of space location to which our actions can be potentially directed objects towards which we can uh, potentially uh, interact or the actions of others. So the cortical motor system long confined to the exclusive role of motor programming and control plays indeed a crucial role in cognition, for example, in terms of object space and others behavior mapping. And embodied simulation is a key ingredient here, is the functional description of a variety of modality of reusing brain circuits uh, from, for different purposes. The sensory motor system in one way is activated to act, but can be reused also to map object space and the actions of others, the behavior of others. So embodied simulation not only connects us to others, I, I started thinking about embodied simulation in the first place in relation to mirroring mechanism to make sense of what the cognitive purchase of this mechanism could be. But I expanded the notion also to other uh, brain secrets in our brain and particularly those dealing with peripersonal space or our relation to manipulable objects. So embodied simulation connects us to our world, a world populated by natural objects man-made objects with or without symbolic nature, and other individual, a world that most of the time uh, uh, we feel at home and, uh, with. So let me turn now to space. What is space? Well, we can provide um, an endless series of definition of, of space. For example, we could start dealing with Euclidean space, geometric space, but it's a space in a way uh, uh, also the virtual space that we are inhabiting uh, in this very moment. I am speaking to you, you are listening to me. We occupy a sort of uh, 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 shared space enabled by uh, this uh, uh, digital technology, particularly through Zoom, but um, we, we, we feel urged to add the adjective virtual because we cannot look into each other's eyes. Uh, uh, if I stretch my eye 
I cannot uh, uh, touch any of you and, and the like. So it's a virtual space. But there are synonyms uh, uh, that sometimes we use interchangeably uh, um, with space. For example, uh, the word place. And uh, uh, the word derived from place, like not place, introduced a few years ago uh, by the French uh, anthropologist uh, uh, Marc Auger. Uh, not places are big department stores, uh, airports, uh, waiting rooms. So places that we occupy, but uh, where uh, we don't exploit that environment uh, uh, in order to uh, conduct uh, uh, intersubjective social uh, practices. And uh, some of this non-place uh, acquire also this uh, uh, creepy uh, aspect uh, of uh, the personalizing uh, uh, and the like. Today, I want to focus on a very specific account of the notion of space, the space related to the body. Let me quote uh, uh, some of you probably will not know uh, because it's totally out of context with respect to uh, um, architecture, but also because uh, Eugène Minkowski, uh, um, a psychiatrist uh, uh, um, of Polish origin, but uh, who worked in France, uh, is very little known uh, to psychiatrists too, uh, um, most likely because uh, uh, most of his work never got translated in English and being English, uh, the lingua franca of academia for most scholars uh, um, uh, uh, simply doesn't exist. But he wrote uh, very uh, interesting books on our experience of time, on our experience of uh, space. And this quote uh, um, uh, is particularly interesting for the purpose of my talk today. So let me uh, read it to you. Uh, we live and act in space, and our personal lives, as well as the social life of humanity, unfolds in space. Life spreads out in space without having a geometric extension in the proper sense of the world. We have need of expansion, of perspective, in order to live. Space is as indispensable as time to the development of life. So the space of Minkowski is uh, referring to is not the space uh, in the uh, account by means of which uh, we can measure the distance uh, between two points in space. It's a more existential uh, uh, space uh, he's dealing with. And uh, Adolf von Hilterbrand, uh, uh, a sculptor and uh, an art theorist uh, um, at the end of the 19th century, uh, uh, published this book, which I warmly recommend to you, uh, particularly those of you who can read it uh, in, in German, The Problems of Form in Figurative Art, uh, published in 1893. And according for Hildebrandt, and I think his perspective is incredibly modern uh, uh, and highly relevant for what we are dealing with here today, space does not constitute an a priori of experience as suggested by Kant, but its product. Artistic images, architecture uh, is always uh, also part of it are effectual, according to von Hildebrand. That is, are the outcome of both the artist's creative production and of the effects they produce on beholders. So there is always this reciprocity where uh, in our case, uh, uh, architecture is the mediator, the go-between. Uh, that's why I emphasize uh, the intersubjective character of our experience, also of architecture. So in this respect, embodied simulation, I think, can shed light on human symbolic expression, both from the point of view of its making and of its experience. For example, it would be interesting to see to which extent the final outcome, the building, for example, is the outcome of a, a projectual uh, uh, phase in which manipulation of, uh, of objects, of models, uh, uh, as play uh, an interesting part in the creative process uh, of the architect. So in so doing, it reveals the intimate intersubjective nature of any creative act. The physical object, the outcome of symbolic expression, 
like a building, an interior design, a design object, becomes, as I said, the mediator of an intersubjective relationship between creator and beholder. So embodied simulation, in my, according to my hypothesis, uh, contributes to generate the peculiar quality of the embodied scene as that plays a significant role in aesthetic experience. And as such is one important ingredient of our appreciation of human symbolic expression, cultural artifacts and their experience. August Schmarsov uh, wrote, every spatial creation is first and foremost the enclosing of a subject. So referring here to the implicit relationship between space and body. So how do we map the space around our body? Uh, many years ago, um, while recording single neurons in the ventral premotor cortex uh, of the macaque, we discovered motor neurons serving the purpose of controlling arm reaching movement and head turning movement to orient toward the stimulus or to move away from it. Well, uh, it was discovered that many of these motor neurons also had sensory properties. They were responding to tactile stimuli applied to the same body part, uh, the movement of which uh, uh, they were controlling, but responded also to visual stimuli approaching that very same body part. So a typical F4 motor neuron serving the purpose of guiding the reaching movement of the right arm would also respond to tactile stimuli applied to the very same body part or to visual stimuli approaching the very same body part. Encoding this visual stimuli not in the usual uh, V1-like retinocentric perspective uh, uh, point of view, but independently from eye position in a body anchored uh, uh, frame of reference. That was brand new back then. So how do a four neuron perceptually work? By means of embodied motor simulation. Seeing or hearing an object or an event at a given location within peripersonal space evokes the motor simulation of the most appropriate acts towards that very same spatial location. So, which means that we should quit uh, treating our perceptual experience of uh, environments, places, rooms, buildings, design objects in purely passive visual uh, point of view. Uh, whenever we lay our gaze upon something, and this metaphor tells a lot about the prehensile, so to speak, uh, quality of our gaze, uh, we activate not only the visual system, but also the motor system, the tactile system, the emotional system, the interoceptive part of our brain for about which I will not uh, talk for sake of uh, uh, brevity. So our perception of any given perceptual object is a synesthetic experience, not only from the psychological point of view or metaphorical point of view, but also from the vantage point of the brain body. And this is the same also for us, for the human brain. Um, it's possible to detect in the human brain a similar uh, frontal parietal circuits, which maps the presence of uh, objects, uh, uh, actions, events, behavior within peripersonal space uh, mapped on the premotor of brain, which also responds to tactile visual and also auditory stimuli. So as intuited by Maurice Merleau-Ponty in his seminal book, The Phenomenology of Perception, space is not a sort of ether in which all things float. The points in space mark in our vicinity, so within the range of our outstretched arm, the varying range of our aims and our gesture. So this particular sector of space has a, a very uh, uh, deep and poignant uh, motor uh, nature. What counts for the orientation of space is not by body as a thinking objective space, but rather, uh, uh, writes uh, Merleau-Ponty, my body as a system of possible actions, a virtual body whose phenomenal place is defined by its task and its situation. 
So you see, even in the world, in the words of uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty, there is a link between our body, its motor potentialities, which from the point of view of the brain squares with the uh, reuse, with simulation, and the world we inhabit with our social practices, which in turn are determined by these motor potentialities. So the primordial quality turning space object and behavior into intentional objects is their constitution as the objects of the embodied intentionality our body's motor potentialities express. So the functional architecture of embodied simulation is a basic characteristic of our brain, which makes possible our rich and diversified experiences of space, objects, and other individuals being at the basis of our capacity to empathize with them. Okay, let me conclude uh, with a few further remarks. The experience of architecture must be understood also in terms of its bodily grounding elements. And I think what I told you today is, uh, is trying to make that point as clear as possible. Uh, as a sort of a uh, small epistemological aside, we should also try hard not to re-establish phrenology with high-tech uh, uh, devices. So we should challenge a too craniocentric type of neuroscience. The levels of description, the personal, the psychological level of description should be kept distinct from the subpersonal level of description. The level of description that deals with neurons, brain circuits, brain areas, and the like. Neurons don't think, they have no experience, they don't have desires, they do not have goals. They are just excitable cells communicating, which is also a metaphor, uh, one another by emitting uh, spikes, uh, electric potentials. All the qualities that we describe as thought, desire, experience, presence, and the like are pertaining to the personal level of description. So we should keep this level distinct, although they are clearly uh, one and the same thing, uh, if we are, uh, as I am, a, a true materialist, but can be described from different perspectives and uh, with different methodologies. So neurons are not epistemic agents. And finally, the so-called mind, I prefer to use the notion of mental processes, is not in the head. Uh, the mind or what we call uh, uh, the mind is in the head, is in the body, is in my feet, is in, in the space I inhabit, uh, where I move around. It is in the body of other individuals. It is in the technological prosthesis, like this smartphone that I uh, constantly using uh, more and more to navigate in the world. So the mind is not in the head, okay? So looking at the building, to come back to our uh, topic, uh, looking at the room or looking at the design object also means simulating the movements, the actions, the sensations, the emotions, the memories that those spaces and objects evoke. The experience of architectonic space in the broadest possible sense frames and affects all human social practices taking place within it. And the very same social practices can in turn and should modify the way architectonic space is experienced. I conclude with a, another quote uh, um, from Adolfo Nildebrand, through movement, the available elements in space can be connected. Objects can be carved out of their background and perceived as such. Through movement, representations and meaning can be formed and articulated. I think this is a very good starting point for any architect uh, sitting down and thinking about uh, uh, to create something, be it an object, uh, an interior design, a building or an urban planning. And this is it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> You're hearing me. <laughs>
we start now with the with the q a thank you so much for this uh, beautiful rich and inspiring uh, presentation i was taking notes and i did not want to get distracted with my notes because i also wanted to listen and pay attention we don't have too much time so i will try to press it as much as possible uh, just to give the first first uh, impulse uh, so one of the things that was uh, very interesting about your presentation was that you specifically mentioned the concept of presence, uh, yeah. the bodily presence uh, in architecture and also in connection with this idea that you explained so, so clearly through your presentation of our body as being this uh, repository of uh, all sorts of motoric, sensorial, emotional experiences. Yes. So, uh, and also uh, our perception of the environment also as this ongoing, very fluid process of continuous construction and, and update of, of the skills that we already have and also the skills that we continuously develop. Uh, so my first question has to do also with the question of time as time relates to the evolution of the body, because, for example, we all know that we, we age. So our skill repository changes changes according to our lifetime. So we might we might through lifelong learning acquire many skills, but we also have to adjust because we we might lose certain motor capacities and so on. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit more uh, about what you know already about the brain and the body and how these skills evolve over time? Well. Um... Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, uh, thank you, Maria, for your question. Well, uh, in the first place, uh, I should say that the vast majority of studies carried out in cognitive neuroscience uh, are targeting young brains and young bodies. <laughs> As uh, most of the participants to our uh, experiments, and this, if you like, add to the coarseness and artificiality, unfortunately, still as we speak of our approach, uh, are targeting uh, um, young uh, adults uh, of the first world, okay? okay. So, uh, and uh, that said, I, I should add uh, that I am not uh, uh, really uh, too much acquainted with the more specialized uh, uh, literature. Uh, certainly there is a literature uh, uh, existing uh, targeting uh, uh, more elderly people, brain and body, which mainly deals, uh, however, to uh, topics uh, related to aging, uh, aging fragility, um, or not to mention uh, uh, brain pathology, particularly occurring uh, at a late age like dementia and the like. Uh, definitely in a in a society that, uh, at least uh, in the first world, uh, is growing uh, older and older, uh, the, the topic of time, which means bodily changes uh, determined by aging, uh, uh, should be at the center of the agenda also uh, for architects. Uh, um, I know of projects that are trying to deal, but this probably doesn't answer your question, there are projects uh, uh, carried out uh, in collaboration between uh, um, specialists in geriatry, aesthetics, uh, and computer science. Uh, they try to cope with um, elderly people's fragility using art. For example, I was uh, supervising uh, uh, a project where they were uh, trying to establish a better level of uh, bodily uh, mobilization in uh, um, elderly communities uh, by um, having them uh, reproduce biometrically bodily posture uh, uh, taken from uh, paintings of the Renaissance uh, uh, with the motion capture uh, system that were, was able to give the, the uh, aging people an instantaneous feedback uh, of their movement, as good they were in matching uh, the posture portrayed in the painting, and that could be spotted on a digital version of the painting, which was illuminated more or less, uh, the more or less uh, the bodily movement were matching uh, those uh, statically reproduced. So this is a possible way to uh, 
well, to use aesthetics and art uh, to um, uh, ameliorate the quality of life of aging people. But uh, what you say is also crucial. I mean, if I am 70 or 80, uh, my pra bodily practices are different from those of uh, uh, younger, uh, younger people. And therefore the way my apartment is designed, the building, the way of access to the building have to be uh, carefully uh, uh, um, uh, thought of uh, in relation to the final user and, and, and the age. You probably know more about uh, what's going on in architecture on this particular aspect than, than, than I do. Uh, but uh, on, on the topics that I dealt with today, there is still very little known in the brain of uh, uh, elderly people, as far as I, I understand. Thank you. Uh, this also brings me uh, in connection with the topic of empathy. And I also found it especially interesting that you mentioned this in connection, not just with uh, architectural spaces or art, but also the broader uh, this broader uh, category that you mentioned as human artifacts. And yeah. I find it especially important also with this um, uh, in connection with the realm of the imagination. And I have to think that if we, if we were somehow restricted in our imagination by our possibilities in the material world or the artifacts we already know, maybe we have never would have never empathized with birds and we wouldn't have managed to go to the moon. Of course, it was a long, long process, but there were some people over the centuries who imagined it would be great to fly and it would be great to, of course, we can't do it with this body, but maybe we can create a, a fake body, a prosthetic body that allows us to take action and actually be able to do those things. So yeah. how do you think in terms of brain and bodily experience, how do you think that this takes place? What's going on in the brain when someone has an idea like that? Well, <laughs> the shortest answer to your question would be, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, it's, it, it's really hard uh, to funnel such a broad perspective uh, to boil down uh, into uh, uh, a few brain mechanisms. Actually, there is a big debate as we speak in cognitive neuroscience uh, about the relationship between the mental categories that we linguistically constantly use to describe our mental process, our thought, our ideas, and the working of the brain body. Whether we can, uh, um, so to speak, project those mental categories uh, onto the brain is matter of debate. And uh, uh, I have serious doubt uh, that uh, we, uh, we will uh, accomplish uh, anything uh, relevant uh, uh, to tell us more about who we are and how we function uh, if we pretend uh, to come up with a one-to-one -one mapping between concepts and brain areas. As I said, it's, um, it's a kind of uh, phrenology 2.0, much worse than the first phrenology because nowadays we, we can do much better than Galen Spurzheim, who poor guys, just the fantasy and creativity they had no tools they had no technological devices to ask questions uh, to the brain so we can do uh, a lot better a lot better than that uh, i find it speci specifically good that you mentioned this in connection with the phrenology because sometimes in our conversations of, about neuroscience for architecture we might get a little too excited about what the data actually tells us because we know the first of all that it's difficult to collect the data as you mentioned in your experiments, we, we are still not able to do experiments in the real world, in real time. So we have these controlled settings, but there are already things that we, that we can correlate. We can actually use the data to, to understand how some things work. Look, uh, I mean, uh, neuroscience is, very, is a very powerful approach uh, because it can address many micro and macro level of, uh, of the brain and the body. The tricky part is to integrate <laughs> those uh, uh, different level of description, but that's not the only difficulty. And to be honest, I must confess that I had much clearer ideas about the purchase of the cognitive neuroscience 20 years ago 
than I do have now. Because the more we understand, uh, in a way, the less the picture uh, 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 becomes clear because we better appreciate the complexity of the topics we want to address. Um, and to make things worse, uh, we all wear the t-shirt the neuroscientist because we use the same uh, methodology, but the starting assumption can be very different. The theoretical framework can be very different. And so it is too naive to, to think that there's just one thing called neuroscience because we all use fMRI. You can use fMRI to address different questions and the questions you address are always uh, are coming from a theoretical background. Even if you are not ready to admit that and say, oh, we don't need philosophy, we don't need the humanities, we have facts, we have the truth of facts and uh, bullshit like that. I mean, uh, luckily enough, many of our colleagues are more articulate than that, although you still may find some ardent neuroscientists that uh, um, who don't want to listen to uh, 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 this kind of debate because he, he believes that or she believes that uh, it's only a matter of time to have more powerful machine and we will be able to sort everything out. I don't believe that for a moment. And I think uh, this debate is very helpful because uh, um, I mean, we, we need to do a lot more epistemology, uh, even if we spend most of our time in the lab. Well, uh, what I also found specifically interesting in, in what concerns the possibilities this brings for architecture was that I always referred, and also in my own research when I was doing my PhD, I was very interested in, in the work of Le Corbusier, and I still am, because he, before he did the modular and all of that, he, when he was working mostly as a painter, he was already very interested in understanding the scientific me uh, mechanisms of, of, our, um, of our perception of color. So he wanted to understand how the color influences our psychology, and he was also interested in how it would influence well-being. And he really wanted to do with the modular also, he called a scientific aesthetics. He wanted to have rules that could be used so to create basically better living, living spaces. And of course, he had uh, lots of limitations and did a lot of mistakes, but I think that, that the intentions and what, what he was looking after uh, still have a lot of uh, possibilities, uh, especially in connection with, with the work you do with experimental aesthetics and all these questions of neuroscience for architecture. I would like now to open the questions to our students. So who would like to make the first question to come here to the aisle? Okay, everyone will come here. So we have here a hybrid mode of, of presence. We have we, have, we are in the physical room and we have we have this meeting owl, which allows right. us to multiple virtual presence, which is also an interesting experience. So again, please go ahead. Um, so my first question is, um, we can feel and react to the environment and uh, through this, we have a connection. What brings us to a good understanding of how to design or what feels good? Are there any studies on how the brain of mental ill or also physical ill people are different to ours and to our experience in order to design more better? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, since the body is central, is the body function differently? Of course, uh, it generates different expectations. Uh, and so this should be, and uh, we, we, we particularly in Europe, I think we, we are more uh, listening to this uh, uh, specifics uh, once we project a, a building or the way of access uh, uh, to any public place because different bodies which express different motor potentialities uh, require uh, different ways of engagement. So this, um, but probably you don't need neuroscience to be aware of that. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, goodwill in the first place and costs. <laughs> okay. Um, and what you inspired me to the question of colors, how much is, is the impact of colors really that huge? And is there a possibility that the effect on colors may change over time? 
Well, yeah, color is a very complicated issue. And I, I toyed with the idea uh, to play with color, to do experiments on, on the psychological quality of color. And there is a huge literature on that. But um, then I read um, a, a short essay on color by um, Sergei Eisenstein, the, the Soviet movie director, a wonderful essay where he clearly demonstrates uh, the historical quality of the uh, um, the historical nature of the psychological quality of, uh, of color. So he makes many examples. Take yellow, for example. It's the color of the sun. It's the color of the saints, uh, uh, of the aura, the aura uh, behind saints figure. But it's also the color of uh, people who were sent to burn on a stack during the Inquisition. Green is the color of, uh, of spring, of youth, of uh, hope, but it's also the color of the eye of Satan. So I said, okay, you know what? I give up. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's so idiosyncratic. I mean, it, it's, it's clear, it's a very interesting topic, the, psych the psychological quality of color, but it needs to be qualified, uh, uh, the color for who, uh, where, how, when, uh, what kind of uh, cultural background, which kind of specific environment, it needs to be qualified. I don't think there is a, a rule of thumb that tells you that uh, red always accomplishes the same psychological results for everyone in every environment and the like. And you take, for example, when, it's, uh, when it comes to decide which color you want to paint your room, there are endless discussion between parties. I wanted yellow. Oh, I, give me a break. No, 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 it has to be pink or it has to be green or whatever. I mean, there is an idiosyncratic quality in our uh, taste for colors that is quite telling. So uh, I don't want to um, curb your hand to chat about color, but it's a very complicated and tricky uh, topic, I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And last week we talked about the influence of urban environments and also how a lot of companies try to fake green their architecture to have the same effect, but that it's not working. And there comes up my question on, is the effect of nature still there if we experience real nature and all no. right all the time? No, no, my favorite design uh, for those uh, Spielplatz and uh, in my experience is Berlin. In Berlin, really, it's a joy to go to the park uh, with your kids because they really get dirty, which means they really have a lot of fun. They can play with sand. They can play with water. Uh, I, I am, it's the best uh, design for uh, a park for kids that I've witnessed in Europe. Uh, uh, and maybe there are even better in other German cities, but uh, as I lived in Berlin, part of my time with my kids when they were pretty young, they were enthusiastic about Spielplatzen, and so was I, because uh, when we got home, they were really dirty, which it was my proof of concept. They had a great time. So artificial nature, what are we talking about? No way. So there's no chance that nature can have a less effect on us if we experience it more often or get over. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, you 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 need to have um, practices, bodily practices, and bodily practices require the real thing. They require uh, uh, the loans, the trees, uh, uh, um, uh, the sand, uh, the smells. Uh, the birds, uh, the squirrels, uh, I mean, nature, nature in, 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 in a word. And um, everybody complains uh, of the lack of nature in, in, the, in our urban planning in many cities. Uh, and uh, uh, just the presence of, of some green, of, of a tree uh, in itself uh, uh, makes, can make a big difference. So. Uh, if you look at the, the way uh, urban planning worked uh, uh, 70 or 80 years ago, 
Here in New York, uh, I make long walks in the weekend. And you can tell the difference when you walk in a neighborhood that were designed uh, in the late 19th centuries uh, and that are miraculously still preserved. Then you make a turn and you find yourself uh, in the 1980s and the landscape changes dramatically. And so your attitude and your feeling uh, uh, gets worse because uh, uh, those plannings uh, were uh, uh, done uh, completely forgetting about all the things I tried to talk about uh, um, this, um, today with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And there's another question here in the room. And then we have one question from Milton Schlingberg and one question in the chat. But okay. we will take the one in the room first. Sorry for the background noise, but uh, there are people working in, in, in the garden beside ours, uh, removing leaves. There are tons of leaves. <laughs> because of the fall. <laughs> well, actually, we don't, we don't hear it. It's, it's working very well. Good, good. Please. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, is very short and it's about space and if you think that we um, that we see space differently um, if we speak different languages because our um, today we had a discussion because in Germany actually the word for room is the same word as the word for space so it's Raum and wow. the, the space, like um, the planets and all, it's an other word. So we thought about, we see space more like in these um, borders, like which define a room, but not as much as the space with, yeah, which is big. And um, also if, if language has an influence of the way we receive. Great question. Yeah, I mean, uh, that tells a lot about the cultural specificity. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I've been speaking of the body, but uh, there's another uh, very important element which we should never forget, which is language. Because language in turn, uh, um, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, acts back on our bodily practice. So the notion of space uh, uh, also depends uh, on the, the words that you use uh, to designate it. And the same applies to a variety of other terms. Uh, is the mind the same as Geist? Who knows? I mean, we, we translate uh, those terms uh, in such a way, but uh, uh, every translation uh, always uh, uh, leaves something behind. And so that's why I find even more unbelievable that there is a kind of uh, modern contemporary canon of architecture that tends to make uh, all the places in the world look the same. If, if you start with the image we started with, Columbus Circle as it looks like uh, as we speak, uh, um, to me uh, looks a lot like uh, Dubai. Uh, it could be Dubai, it could be uh, the downtown of another Western city, anywhere, any place, uh, but since the word we use to designate these crucial elements uh, of our social practices are different, which implies that also our way to deal with them is different, would call for a much more culturally sound way of designing uh, the realm uh, 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 where we live. While we see exactly the opposite happening, places tend to look all the same everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can buy the same uh, H&M clothes in Parma, in New York, in Berlin, in Stuttgart, uh, in, in any place. And this uniformation uh, of the social practices, I think uh, may be useful, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, takes away a lot uh, because um, culture is different in the first place. Thank you very much. <laughs> Milton, you also had a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, Vittorio, um, as usual, you are illuminating so much in an amazingly short time. Thank you. Um, I, wanna, I wanted to say something about speculative 
um, approaches to your question of how you get the whole experience as opposed to the narrow experience. So let's say a synthetic reading. Um, and what I've been doing as an architect for years, and now I'm really trying to understand better, um, is what I would call capturing utterances from the people themselves. So when I'm doing a project and I meet with clients, I give great priority and credence to different ways they express themselves. Sometimes it's verbal, sometimes it's nonverbal. Um, taking them to a place, asking them to take pictures of what has an impact on them, and then uh, telling someone who's with them or a recording device what's going on. Um, and I find sometimes you can get to unconscious wishes, desires, all sorts of things through through verbal narrative uh, kinds of of uh, querying. I think that that's a something that architects can do with neuroscientists because there's a lot of speculative thoughts that then could be tested. Yeah, I think uh, you raise a very interesting point, uh, which uh, broadly speaking is the constant or possible dissociation between the explicit and the implicit. The explicit is what I'm telling you, the implicit is what my body is telling you. And they might not necessarily overlap. And marketing failures demonstrate that uh, focus group are not the whole thing. Uh, uh, because you may say, oh, I like it. Would you buy this for that price? Oh, sure, I will. And then it's a complete failure and they have to retract that product because, I mean, there are many instances that do not make it to words, but they clearly make it at the level of the body. So I think what you are doing is probably helping you greatly in approaching the real desire of your clients. Yeah, I understand that uh, sampling uh, what people's opinions are sometimes fails because people just want to answer. They want to give you an answer. And sometimes they just make it up like, what's the, what's the best way to get to the McDonald's on 14th Street? And they don't know, but they tell you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Totally. Uh, there, we, have, sorry. we have also a question here on the chat from Margaret Carveca. How do you think architects can approach the design of shared, ex, of shared spaces within the global context, given that everybody's past experiences and memories are different across different cultures and neurodiverse, neurodiversities? Along the same lines, is there no such thing as global architecture? Structuralists such as Edward T. Hall try to explore the idea of proxemics and spatial perceptions specific to different cultures, but this approach was criticized as being reductive. Reductive. Well, yes. Uh, I mean, there is always the danger to be called a reductionist. I don't feel particularly ashamed if someone called me a reductionist, provided that we qualify reductionism as a methodological reductionism which means that the issues at stake are so complex, if you want to address them empirically, you have to reduce the biggest question into more uh, manipulable, uh, uh, smaller entities, uh, uh, being uh, aware that what you are doing is oversimplifying complex problems. Uh, I don't want to be called a reductionist uh, if what is implied is ontological reduction which boils down to say, I am my neurons, or I am my liver, I am my guts, which is at best only uh, partial truths. So what uh, these attempts, I think, are, are, are very important. Uh, and I think people should uh, 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 let themselves uh, be heard more when it comes, uh, how do I want my city will look like uh, in the next 20 years? Uh, I think in the political discourse, these topics uh, uh, are not very present. Uh, I mean, people are more worried probably by more basic issues like the cost of energy as we speak uh, and the like, but also who decides uh, uh, how the place where I'm going to live uh, will look like uh, uh, should see a more prominent role uh, bottom up from the people and people mm -hmm. probably, uh, some movement in architecture should make that more explicit and solicit uh, people participation. Because otherwise we will end up, uh, in spite of this very meritorious attempt, uh, uh, it will be Dubai all over the world if we keep on doing mm -hmm. like this. Dubai or Shanghai or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. This uh, generic, <laughs> yeah. generic of architecture, or new architecture. Um, I would just have one final question without taking too much of your time. You were already so generous for being here with us. Okay. Uh, and this has to do with, with this uh, topic that you also mentioned of the habits and uh, social practices as yeah. related to, to culture. And today in the morning, I was giving my, my lecture on, on um, uh, design history, and we were talking about the beginning of before Bauhaus and all, all of these movements that were trying to use design also also with this ideology of social reform uh, but ultimately all of them failed because we know that they were instrumentalized by all sorts of propaganda they were used also by totalitarian regimes so and we are living in a in a moment which has some historical parallel so i, I often wonder in how far can we can we actually make good use of what we already know about the power of design and also what we know about uh, the, the, that neuroscience can tell us about how, how we connect to artifacts. And um, so where's the line? In how far can we understand that we can shape culture and we can shape new habits without creating again uh, these uh, totalitarian systems through, through design practices? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was thinking uh, while listening to you about uh, uh, how to design a window, for example. I mean, in this country, the vast majority of the windows I've been dealing with or just uh, saw walking in the street operates like this, guillotine-like or on the horizontal plane. The country where I come from, most of the time, the windows enable this kind of gesture. You open the window like this, you close it like this. So leaving aside the, the metaphorical quality of this movement of aperture, which has been explored also in relation to language. Uh, I wonder um, whether this kind of relationship, the relationship between the object of design and the bodily practice it elicit has been entirely or thoroughly focused. Another example, think about uh, the richness of our bodily gesture and expressions that uh, Milton was referring to when dealing, for example, with, with, with his clients. And how much of it gets lost on a daily basis because of the specific design of a variety of objects. Take the car. I mean, my new car is not anymore the, the, the hand-operated brake. If I want to break the car, I push a button. If I want to start the car, I also push a button. If I want a coffee, I don't, I use the mocha. So I have a very specific sequence of end gesture uh, in order to uh, uh, fulfill my desire to drink coffee. But most of the time you push a button. So different desires, different outcomes are all funneled within this leophilized, uh, 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 abstracted, uh, the same type of gesture. This mm -hmm. diminishes our expressive creativity. And let me add a, a further uh, a psychological ingredient. It compresses the time between the expression of the desire and its fulfillment. In the morning, when I get up, I desire to have coffee in order to fulfill that desire, I am required to do it through a series of manual operations that differ desire from its fulfillment by at the very least uh, five to eight minutes. With uh, an espresso or whatever, desire, push a button, desire fulfilled in a few seconds. Are we sure that this has an impact on our subjectivity, our identity, our psychological profile? This is a big question, Mark. I, I like to leave you with to think about it. Yes, it's, it's, it's a wonderful with the ritual of the coffee. And as a Portuguese, of course, I totally relate to this. Uh, and uh, uh, we Portuguese, we love to go outside to have coffee. We might have the best coffee at home and also ways to do it and so on. But it's not just about drinking the coffee. It's getting ready, getting out, 
taking uh, walking a few steps, seeing a few faces, and then getting the coffee either sitting or standing and all these different <coughs> modalities. It's the whole as uh, exactly it's the whole social practice and habit and also the ritual of doing it, which and then, then the coffee is just maybe the end of the experience. Okay, Vittorio, we will finish for now. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your knowledge with us. It was Thank very- Thank you for, for having me with you today. Bye-bye and uh, um, best wishes for the forthcoming uh, uh, talks. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.